thank you for inviting me. And I am truly honored to be talking to you today. Um, as you can see, the, the title of my presentation uh, will be Rembrandt as an innovative printmaker. Um, and I'm going to start off, there we are, with uh, two paintings. Um, and those will be probably the last paintings you'll see in the rest of my presentation, because it will be about prints. But these are two 19th century paintings. Uh, the one over here uh, to the left is Nicolas Pinemann, which shows his interpretation of Rembrandt basically admiring an etching, but the, the etching he is admiring, some of you may recognize them, is the famous portrait of Jan Six. Um, and in the back, you can see some of his utensils as a printmaker, because there's a copper plate, and there's also this screen in front of the window that printmakers would use to basically temper the light and make sure that they don't have reflection. Um, the other painting is by Jean-Léon Jérôme, a French contemporary, also 19th century, mid-19th mid century, where you see Rembrandt etching. So the etching acid is actually in the glass bottle. But I thought this is a nice introduction to the subject, and as I mentioned, probably the last paintings you'll see. Um, I'm going to talk about Rembrandt as an experimental and innovative printmaker. And the central question is, why are Rembrandt's etchings, his prints, so special, so, so new, and so influential. The first thing to notice in the case of Rembrandt is that his etchings are not, and in no way, reproductions of his paintings. They're all independent works themselves. Um, the answer to why he is such a good uh, etcher can be divided into a few components. First of all, the numerical size of his oeuvre is striking. And you have to realize that etching was not Rembrandt's main occupation. He was foremost and all a painter. And he made his etchings on the side, um, but did that very well. The combination of a painter making etchings was not exceptional in the 17th century. Um, Etching in itself is not an extremely difficult technique. If you can draw on a piece of painter, you can basically also etch. And it's a simplification, as you might understand, but it is true. There are several other 17th century Dutch painters who made, uh, who made prints. For example, Klaas Mouillard uh, is famous for his biblical scenes and landscapes. He made 33 etchings. Ferdinand Boll, a Rembrandt pupil, made 24 etchings, almost all biblical subjects. Paulus Potter, you may know him, he made uh, 20 etchings, all true to his, well, subject, main subject as a painter, so they're all uh, about cattle. Rembrandt, on the other hand, made 314 etchings, which is way, way, way more than everybody else did. And um, he did so in an incredible wide range of subjects. While the, 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 all the other well, painters basically kept true to their main subject, Rembrandt uh, did not. There we are. Um, and these five paintings, each etching stands for a subject. So there is Old Testament subjects, there is, and which is Abraham caressing his son Isaac. Here is the, uh, the Christus at the well, the Samaritan woman, which is a New Testament subject. This is Saint Jerome with a, a willow tree, which stands for the saints that he depicted. This is the marriage of Jason and Creusa, which is a mythological uh, subject. And here, uh, in this case, it's Diana, but it stands for the nudes that Rembrandt depicted. Then there is genre, the beggars at the door. There is landscape, where the piece in the center is an example of. There is 
first time the famous portrait of Jan VI that we saw in the painting uh, being admired. Then there is a lot of self-portraits and what you can call uh, character heads. So basically people, uh, depictions of people here. That is what Rembrandt, well the whole scope, the whole width of everything that Rembrandt uh, did. Um, another way in which Rembrandt distinguished himself from all other 17th century printmakers is the manner in which he made his etchings. And that is the subject of this talk. Um, but before I go into that, I'm going to explain to you briefly, because it will be crucial that you understand what we're talking about, how an etching is made. To make an etching, you start out with a copper plate and you make it as smooth as you can. Basically, you should be able to see yourself in it like a mirror. So you have to polish it until you, you see yourself up to the point where you, if you leave water on it, it will not stick. It will just tend to run off that smooth. Um, then you have to attach uh, an etching ground, which is basically a mixture of beeswax and raisin. And to attach that to the copper plate, you need to heat it slightly, which is why the heater is uh, in the top part of the, um, of the image, of, the, of the, the, the impression. These are engravings from, uh, from uh, an 18th century manual. Um, then you apply, when it's heated, you apply the, 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 the etching ground, but the action, etching ground itself is translucent, so you don't see anything. You just keep seeing the copper, uh, which is difficult if you are going to draw in it from to see what you did. So to, to blacken the varnish, you need a candle, and to suit the, 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 the lamp black, to suit the copper plate, um, so that the surface is basically black. And if you then start to draw in it with an etching needle, uh, into the black, the lines will appear again as red lines, which is basically the copper plate again, but laying bare. Um, once you're past that, you need to cover the back of the copper plate with varnish, basically to protect it from the acid that you're going to pour over it. There were several methods of doing that. You could do it like that. To just to pour it, to put it in a in a box and pour it over. But you could also uh, lay it down in a in a large well tray filled with with acid. The acid they did use in the 17th century is either nitric acid, um, salpetersuur, or acid well basically based on vinegar. What acid Rembrandt used, we don't know. Probably the vinegar variant, because nitric acid is much more aggressive. And he is known for his very subtle lines. Once you've done that, you remove the varnish, because you're, you're all done. Um, the, the, the lines are etched into the copper plate. Then you ink it, and you lay a damp sheet of paper over it, and you run it through the press. And what comes out? is you can see them drying up there, is basically the impressions, the etchings themselves. Okay. Um, the, yeah, Rembrandt, as an etcher, was an autodidact, which means he, he taught himself. And you can see that, in a way, because his unusual methods of making an etching. I'll, I will show you. But that is also, for me, an indication that he had no teacher, because otherwise he would have been more traditional uh, in the way everybody else did it. Now I'm going to show you a comparison. Mm. Yes. Um, this is an engraving. So it's not the same technique, but an engraving. This is, uh, this is the Hercules Farnese by Hendrik Holtius, who is a, a late 16th century uh, engraver. And if you zoom in, 
is the, his shoulder. And you can see a very regular mesh of lines that are used to describe shape and describe form. Um, the way this is done, wait a minute, is with a burin. And a burin is basically a, 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 a sharp stick with a wooden end, and you put the wooden end in your hand and you just go through the through the copper. So the, the lines in the copper are more or less the same, but it's a different method. Um, I have here an example of how different that looks, because in this case you really cut the copper out of the copper plates and it will curl up in front of the tip of the burin. Now, to Rembrandt, maybe I just, there we are. Um, this is Rembrandt's etching, where you can see there is nothing regular in his drawing here. It, you, but basically what you see is a draftsman. A, 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 he, he, it's like a drawing, completely different in conception than these engravings. Um, before I continue, there is one other thing that I need to explain, and that is what different states are. Because what Rembrandt did is not prepare his compositions with a drawing, like many of the other artists did, but basically go straight to the copper plate and work on it as if it were uh, a, a, draw, a, a sheet of paper. <coughs> you can make changes to a copper plate by recovering the copper plate with varnish again, and then add stuff. If you if you etch a house, and you and you print it, and you think, well, I need a cloud next to the house, then you can refarnish it, draw the cloud into the varnish, etch it again, and then print it again. That is what we call with the cloud is the second state. Without the cloud is the first state, and you can go on infinitely. If you want to have a tree next to the to the house, you can uh, do it again, and that would be the third state. Now, this is um, the final version. Now, this, this is the, <coughs> sorry, the, the first state of this etching, where you can see, where I'm going to show you, how Rembrandt developed, can I have the next slide? Because it, I'm not quite sure why. Yeah, this will do for now, because this is a detail of the upper right corner of the etching, where you can see clearly this is a draftsman at work, not an engraver, but it is very sketchy. It's, and you have to realize the size of this print is, I think, about 10 centimeters high and 6 centimeters wide. So it's tiny, tiny, but it's beautiful. Do I? Okay. There we are. The tiny etching you saw. The composition is, is derived from a painting that he made one year earlier, 1629, which is now in a British uh, collection, where you can see basically here, this is the re Judas repenting, and he's returning the seven of the, 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 the silver coins on the ground there, but the whole composition is more or less the same uh, what you have in the etching, except that Christ is Christ disputing uh, in, 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 the, in the temple with the doctors. Christ is in the position of Judas and the doctors, well, they're still there. There we are. These two may look very similar, but they're not. To the left is the first state, where you can see how Rembrandt started out. The first effort on, on the copper plate was like that. And you can see that he has a lot of, where am I? Here, there's a lot of open areas. There's somebody behind the desk, but he is alone. And Rembrandt must have looked at it and thought, this is not what I intend. 
So he darkened, and that's the state here to the right, he darkened these areas. And it's all in the copper plate. So here the figures are outlined, but they are there completely covered um, with lines. But he still thought, it's not what I want. There we are. So to the left is again the second state for comparison, and to the to the uh, to the right here is the third and the final state. And what you can see is that he removed the dark corner to the right um, and placed the figures behind the table. And then he must have thought, okay, this is what I want to have, and started printing an edition. Um, and again, what I'm trying to show you here is how Rembrandt developed on the copper plate his ideas of how the composition should look, what the composition should look like. Okay. Now, in this case, this is 1630. So Rembrandt is still in his mid-20s. He's, he's, he's still a, a young man. Um, but here, it's tiny, but you see mainly a focus on form. He didn't have any particular interest in textual exp expression. But it is something that was on his mind, as you can see in the next... There we are. This is a self-portrait from a year later, where he devoted much more attention to texture, to embroidery, to, well, basically expression of, and also a background. This is a slightly larger, it's one of his first um, quite formal self-portraits. But this result didn't get here in one go, because this state, this print, this etching, is known in 15 states, 15 tiny steps that he used to come here. There we are. Um, I'm not going to show them all, but I'm going to show you a few to, to give an impression. He started out with the head, and then eventually added the body, but here there is not yet very, you can't recognize the, the, the cloak as velvety, and you can't see the embroidery that's going to be here, but it's still all there. What you're looking at, and the comparison is about the area here. There is a, what you're looking at is the brim of the hat. In the next slide, you'll see the hat again, then you really realize exactly where it is, but it's the brim of the hat, and it's, I'm, I'm showing it to you to explain some of the very tiny steps he was ready to take. Here, a few of the lines are missing, and here he added that, those, and that's basically what he did here. It, this is the third and fourth state. Now, that's again an early state without the background, where you can see the hat again. We were looking at this area uh, earlier. So, sometimes it's it's Um But then he adds the embroidery here, and well, the, the, the cloak, and the background. Um, I have another example, but I'm going th through it faster. Um, this is a beggar, the, the blind violin player. It's around 1630, 1631, sorry, um, because it says uh, at the bottom. Um, what I'm going to do is show you all the changes here. So at first, there was a loop here that he removed in the second state. Um, then there is some, well, I don't know what's going on there, but he removed it in the next state. Um, one of my favorites, the dog, uh, where you can see that here the dog is, well, it's not yet completely curled, but he added a few lines also on the, uh, he made the, the dog look a little bit more scruffy than before. 
one of, also a favorite of mine, because what you see here is the leg of the beggar, but he adds some lines here. Do you see that? And I mean, um, here they are single lines, and here he <coughs> seems to have doubled them. It's one of those instances where you think, what were you doing? I mean, you're making an etching and that's what you look at. It's like there is some, in, there is, like he, he couldn't make up his mind. Um, but it's also the sign of a fairly unexperienced printmaker, which he was. The shoulder, where you can see some added lines here. But he is, I, I, I don't have another word for it, he's fiddling around. He is developing the image, but it, it's not going anywhere, it's just basically re returning to the image again and again and again without much effort. Um, here the changes are to the back of the figure. There is some lighter area here that he rehatched. Um, then here we enter in a different area because here you can see the area here is in regular lines and there seems to be engraved lines here, which is probably the reworking by another artist, but still very early because uh, on the basis of the watermarks in the paper, we know this is still uh, early 17th century paper. So it, it must have been, well, very soon. Here also the back of the, of the, the bagger is, is reworked. A very interesting example, and this is another uh, bagger, but it is an example intended to show you a different aspect of how Rembrandt made his etchings. This is um, a bagger that we already knew, but this impression is in Budapest. I found it in Budapest. And uh, what is remarkable is that it has a lot of traces of an earlier depiction in the background. And we didn't know that. All the other impressions known, so this is an impression for the then known first state, they don't show this. And I remember um, sitting at the airport, I was waiting for my flight home and I saw all the photographs I took in the, in the print room in Budapest and I thought, I must be able to find that. It looks so specific that you should be able to recognize it. Then I was looking at this print, which is a Saint Jerome. It's a huge print. It's extremely early. And I hope that you can see that it is not very successful. It's rare. There were only two impressions, but also the general layout, um, like he, he couldn't yet do it. It's too flat. Well, it's rare anyway. But I was looking at this print and then I got lucky. What I want you to see is the details here that are there too. So I, I put it deliberately right next to where it should come from. Um, but you probably expect this is. So what you're looking at is an etching that Rembrandt made that he cut out of a larger copper plate by himself. Now. While I was looking at this print, uh, my, something caught my eye. There we are. This is in front of the Saint Jerome and you have this strange, I don't know what it is. It looks like the beginning, about the base of a candle or something, but, and I thought, I have seen that before. And here you see the same. So, what this is, is basically I found another one, also coming from the same copper plate. There we are. So two prints coming from a copper plate that was discarded by Rembrandt. Well, if you if you see well, if you discover something like this, it changes your perspective for a lot of other prints. Because this is another example, the, the print to the, to the, to the left is uh, well, it's the flight into Egypt with Joseph and Mary on the, on the donkey. Um, very rare, and it, we, we already knew that it had been cut up. Um, 
this is the the well basically the etching of only the Saint Joseph. But if you look carefully, you'll see here the head of the Virgin. So this section of the copper plate was used for um, for a self-portrait. I'm not going to, to show you the self-portrait because it's not the point. The point is another example where Rembrandt reused his own copper plates. Now, if you look at these, then you start wondering, this must from be from some other copper plate as well. If you look at the, well, what's going on in the background there, or here, the, the hatching traces from another, but I haven't been able to find it. So it must be, but we don't know. Here are two other examples where a very rare prints, um, only two or three impressions, but I haven't been able to find something. But it means these were undoubtedly also cut up and used for, well, new etchings that Rembrandt was going to make. I have to catch up with my paper. Um, okay. Um, after after this, and we are talking 1631, Rembrandt is 25. After this, he quickly developed into an experienced etcher, and very soon he didn't have necessity to go through all these steps, but could make an etching basically in one go. And that is what you see here. This is the homecoming of the prodigal son with his forgiving father, and but this print is known in one state. So immediately, and also the, uh, the the Abraham caressing his son, Abraham caressing Isaac, um, of 1637, which is also an example where only one state, or at least one contemporary state, is known. Um, and I have another example. There we are, the beheading of Saint John the Baptist, also in in one state. But I'm showing you this because this points to another problem that Rembrandt ran into. And the problem is he used such a dense mash of lines that forms tend to dissolve. You, you can't really see what's going on. There are figures here in the back, but uh, they, they almost get lost in all the lines that he used to, to depict. And that's not something specific for this print. Uh, because here too, you can see that, well, the pillar in the background, the arch, it kind of gets lost in the, in the image. This is around 1640. So he was an accomplished printmaker, but, well, ran into his next problem. And the problem is a lack of contrast. And he didn't know how to, well, at, at least at that point, he did not find a good way to do it. Um, but he did find a solution, and the solution was quite revolutionary. He used dry point. And dry point is a very old graphic technique where you don't write into an etching ground, but you scratch Im directly into the copper plate. And this is an example. This is Seymour Hayden, so that's late 19th century, but it is completely um, executed in dry point, while the hands are seen doing exactly that, because it's the, the, the print is called hands dry pointing. Um, what happens if you scratch into the copper plate is that the copper, you, you've seen the burin, everyone, where, where you literally cut it out of the copper plate and it curls up in front of the tip of the burin. With uh, with dry point, something else happens because you scratch into the copper plate and the copper tends to heap up at the sides of the line. And uh, so there is a, sh a short brim, a, a little brim on the side of the lines. And if you ink the copper plate, a little ink will get stuck in the, what we call the burr. And that creates a velvety effect that you can see here, but probably better even here. It's not a sharp line, but it's a fuzzy line. But that fuzziness was what Rembrandt started to, well, explore. Um, as I said, the technique in itself is not new. It was already known in the, uh, in the 15th century. This is an example 
uh, in the, from the 16th century, but it, at the time it was used as an auxiliary technique, so as, as a, basically as a helping technique. It's not the main thing you do, but some things you can do in dry point. For example, draw the design into the copper plate. This is Jan Muller with uh, the rape of a Sabinian woman, where you can see the burr, especially here, the, the velvety effect. So this is in, indeed, it is scratched into the copper plate. But it's finished like this. And I mean, he, he just turned it into an engraving. Here you can see the background still, um, th these are all impressions from the Rijksmuseum collection. The background filled in with black chalk, so drawn in, and then executed in, in engraving as well here. A, sl a slight detail of the same uh, head, where you can see, well, you don't see anything anymore of the of the dry point. Um, in the 15th century, there was one artist who made, well, basically prints. This is the master of the Amsterdam cabinet. Um, in Germany, they call it the Hausbuchmeister from uh, from the Wolfeck collection and, uh, above above Munich. But he is one of the, well, basically the only one who made his etchings completely in. Uh, in dry point. Now, Rembrandt too used dry point, but as an auxiliary technique. Two examples here: a self-portrait from 1630 and a self-portrait with some dry point. And I'm going to show you the dry point a little bit better. This is the cap, as you probably will recognize. And in the next state, you can see here: this is a dry point line but it is the finishing touch. It's not how he makes his etchings, but he uses it to complete uh, what he did. But back to 1640, later on, where he starts to apply a different use of dry point. This is probably completely done in dry point, and you can see here, especially, that there is way more black than in the presentation of in the temple that I showed you before. I'm going to put them side by side. But you can see this is, well, basically the way to, to gray um, depictions. And this is where he applied dry point and was able to, to achieve a much deeper black. That was revolutionary. And there weren't riots in the street, etc. But he completely transformed the technique because um, what he did is basically search out the, 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 the velvety effects of the burr to, for, for decorative effects. Not, so he didn't use the technique for slight details, but he really wanted to achieve something different. Um, okay, I have to catch up a little bit. I think, in a way, that is the main, and I'm, I'm going to continue in this, but this is the main contribution of Rembrandt in the realm of printmaking, the introduction of, uh, of dry point as an independent technique, not as auxiliary, as, as for small details, but really, because nowadays every graphic artist is very familiar with making dry points, but at Rembrandt's time, that was new, that was novel. A nice subject, completely in dry point, especially the bed. Um, of course, this is one what they call the sujet libre, the, the, the more free subject, and it's very nice, but um, it's still very draftsman-like. And what I want you to notice is the woman has three arms. There is a hand here, which is hers, there is a hand there, which is hers, but there is another hand here. And Rembrandt never bothered to remove it. You think well, that's fine. Now, again, a look at the portrait by Jan Six. This is a combination of etching. Well, Rembrandt started out in etching, but he finished it completely in in dry point. And you, when you're ever in Amsterdam and you visit the print room ask for this etching, you can, because everybody who wants to see it can just let them know and they will bring it forward. But there is more subtlety 
in blacks and greys in the original than you can ever convey in a, in a, in a print. It's, it's stunning. It's, it's literally stunning. But it is also, um, well, part of a development into the semi-photographic, which is characteristic for Rembrandt around this period. This is the late 1640s. You could, it, it's not far away from a photograph. Um, the most well-known example of that, of course, is the 100 Gilder print, which is the same. And especially in this area, you can see, I hope it still works. Yes. Um, you can see, well, the same nuances in greys and blacks that almost look photographic. Um, this print, and I'm going back for once, this print at that time was Rembrandt's masterpiece, and it was also intended as a showpiece. Um, here he showed what he could do, technically, but also iconographically, because in this image he basically concentrates all of Matthew 19, and that's the chapter where, um, well, Christ says, let the children come to me, but also about the rich man will have, that will have more trouble getting into heaven than a camel, here's the camel, will have going through the eye of a needle. And all of chapter 19 in Matthew is concentrated here around, around Christ which is iconographically completely novel. Nobody, there, there isn't, there's no other artist who did anything like that. And that combined with a beautiful technique, and this is one of the first etchings that Rembrandt started to print, not on regular European paper, but on Japanese paper. I'll, I'll, I'll continue on that momentarily, but I want to show you something remarkable first. That's the detail, and then there we are. You probably immediately realize this is the same picture, but then reversed. But this is what's on the copper plate. Because if you make an etching and you print it, then necessarily on the image, the, the, on, the, on, on the print, the image will be reversed it's inevitable but it is very funny to see that Rembrandt never took much notice to that effect in his prints all, all, all musicians are left handed even Christ is left handed there is one image of Christ chasing the money changers out of the temple and he's left handed and Abraham um, sacrificing his son it's left-handed, but in his paintings, they're always right-handed, which means that Rembrandt depicted them on the copper plate just regularly right-handed, but they turn out left-handed. But this here too, and I want you to notice that actually this works quite well. People tend to read an image from the right to the left, which may have something to do with the, with the way we read where you start at the upper, uh, upper left corner and you end at the right. But if you look at it like that, the people coming from the left into the light, and in the light, also this figure here, which is uh, more or less blocking the gaze. From you, come, you go through the, and he, you're blocked by that figure. So actually this works very well. In a way, according to me, and I don't want to be detrimental to Rembrandt, but this is the better version of the composition. I'm going to show you one more example, but not yet. Okay, from here on, and I mean from here on, the photographic style of the semi-photographic style in the 100 Gilder print, Rembrandt developed again, but into a rougher style. Um, But he kept using the dry point, and I have a very beautiful example of that. This is a landscape, completely executed in dry point, but also illustrating what I mean that he went back to a rougher style, 
he, he left a semi-photographic, and this is almost an impressionist print. It's, it's, it's not very large, it's, uh, but it, is, it could be in, well, 19th century impressionism. But it also points to a very important problem, and, um, and the problem is that this burr, this dry point, is a very fragile technique. The, the burr, the, the rims at the sides of the lines, they tend to be flattened out by the press. So you could make, could make about 50 impressions, and then you have no burr left, which completely changes the image, and I have an example of that. Have a close look at this one, and then I'm going to show you the same print, but with much more wear. And it can even get worse, but I don't have a photograph of that. But you, you see that it, it starts to light up, it starts to basically to wear down. Um, this affects the way Rembrandt made his etchings, because um, when he was making his prints, he had to calculate, okay, I have 30 to 50 impressions to make, and then the, the burr is gone, the beauty is gone, so he had to remedy, in one way or another, uh, that problem. And he did. Um, and what he did is um, start combining, developing his image with remedy the wear. So a lot of the new work in the next state is also intended to cover up that some of the lines are starting to wear. Um, but this whole idea of making prints and keep reworking while you're going, that was something novel. The no, but no, no other artist at the time did that. Um, what he also did is make every print into something special. Normally, a printed edition is more or less uniform. Every impression is more or less the same, but Rembrandt moved away from that by using them, by, by using different papers, Japanese paper, um, cartridge paper, regular paper, but also by printing them, inking them differently. I have one example of that. This is um, Saint Jerome in an Italian landscape with a very prominent lion, as you can see, um, which also indicates that well, the, the lion is completely convincing. So it also proves that at, by that time he had seen a real life uh, lion. But the impression to the left is on Japanese paper. The impression in the center is on cartridge paper. And cartridge paper is paper is, is not an actual printing paper. It's paper intended for cartridges, for, for gunpowder. If, if every time you had to load a musket, you had to add uh, gunpowder, and that, that was kept in bags, and th those were made of cartridge paper. And that was rough wrapping paper. Um, you can see here a little bit. And what I want you to see is all the fibers that are clearly visible in the it's also often <coughs> substantially more gray than regular writing paper or printing paper, but it's, it's different. Um, but he also started to use Japanese paper. And Japanese paper um, was paper that indeed came from Japan, but it was brought to Amsterdam uh, via the VOC, which is the United... Uh, the United East Indian Company, so the, the trading company, the Dutch trading company, um, famous and notorious at the same time. Um, they needed more, for, the, for their administration, they needed more paper in Indonesia than they had, so they started to buy local paper, which is Japanese paper in part. And that came to Amsterdam, and well, basically Rembrandt recognized that that was actually quite nice paper to print on, because Japanese paper, is usually way more yellow, more golden, and reacts differently from Western paper. Western paper absorbs the ink, while J Japanese paper well, leaves it a little bit more on the surface. But with this burr, if you combine it with prints that made, made with burr, it gives a beautiful effect. This is the entombment a print from 1654, so this is already late Rembrandt, late in his career, with an impression on Western paper, an impression on Oriental paper, to, to see the difference. 
Um, occasionally, he also used vellum, so calf skin. Um, here, this is the same print, but in the next state where he darkened it way more. But the impression to the left is on golden vellum, and the impression on the right is on regular Western paper. Now, vellum was expensive, as you can imagine. You could buy 12 sheets of vellum for the same price as you could have one ream, sorry, one ream of paper. So 500 sheets of paper would cost the same as 12 sheets of vellum. Which indicates that vellum is printed on vellum is really an edition de luxe. It was intended for sale and it was intended to be something special. That's not the only thing he starts doing. What he also starts doing is using surface tone. And surface tone is a graphic trick. Uh, usually when you ink a copper plate, you put ink in the lines, but you remove as much as possible from the surface, which will give a clear, bright, beautiful impression. But you can also leave a, a slight film on the surface, which gives the same effect. This is, these are two impressions. Uh, this one, I think, yeah, it's, it's just, um, this one is a regular print, the, the presentation in the temple. This is the same print, but inked completely differently. But surface tone here. This is not Japanese paper, it's, it's surface tone. Um, I have another, how am I doing, what, what, what time? Okay. Um, another example, this is the woman with the arrow, one of Rembrandt's nudes where you can see, especially, and it's the same state, but you can see in the top, especially here, that it is inked, the surface is inked differently. Um, so Rembrandt started, I have a detail, explaining a little bit more. And um, I mean, also in the other impression, you can see a slight brim of the original paper indicating that's much brighter. So also in the left impression, there is some plate tone, but here it is way more heavy. It's almost like you, you have difficulty seeing the line, but that is how Rembrandt started manipulating his prints. And again, at that time, 17th century, no other artist did that. Maybe, possibly, sometimes Hercules Segers, but that's the only one and he did it completely differently. But all the other artists didn't work like that. So this is Rembrandt setting a trend. Rembrandt being innovative and also eventually very um, influential. Now, um, this way of making prints turned into a novelty for Rembrandt, but also he made it into a marketing strategy because it meant that from the very first impressions that he made, everything was intended to be sold. Normally, with a proof, with a proof impression, that's made, okay, but how am I doing, printmaker? And, uh, and you evaluate what needs to be done, and then you throw away the proof and can continue. But Rembrandt here, from the very first start, he started to print them on Japanese paper with surface tone or even with vellum, but everything from the start to the end was intended to be sold. I'm going to, to come back to that, but I give you a very impressive example. These, this is uh, probably one of the masterpieces in the, from its later period, the Three Crosses. It is executed completely in dry point to all the velvety effect, it's dry point. This one is printed on vellum. And um, I counted the number of impressions we know from the first state, this is the first state, there are 19 impressions, 17 of them are printed on vellum, which clearly indicates they were all intended to be sold. Beautiful. Another, this is another example both are in the Rijksmuseum collection. This is also on vellum, but it's way more gray. It's, it's a different impression, probably because the vellum re responded differently. But you can see, it, it, it just looks stunning. Um, but 
if you continue to, to print, the, the burr will wear. So this is the second state. Well, you can already see, this is a second state. Um, there are eight impressions known. Um, none of them on vellum, but you can see what happens, that the image starts to lighten up. I think I have another. Yes. To the, right, to, the, to the left, you have the second state, where you can see that it really starts to lighten up. And then the third state, which was basically intended not to elaborate the image, but to darken it again. So he is remedying the wear. We can see in the figures here, but also here, the, the, the foreground. I always like to look at the dog, because under the dog in the second state there are no lines, but in the third state, which also has his signature, um, there are new lines. Again, the same impression of the third state and a much later impression. And I, what I want you to see is the progressing wear, which will cause the image to lighten up. So the third state is known to me in 19 impressions, which is considerable. You're almost approaching 50, where you don't have... And this one well, clearly shows you um, what the effect was. So Rembrandt faced a dilemma. He had a large plate, must have been very expensive, and 50 impressions, and actually there was no good impressions you could do. So what did he do? Completely reworked it. And drastically. Um, and also turned it into a very dramatic image. Uh, compl he completely covered it, all these lines, which are dead straight, so he must have had a ruler where he was just, I, I, I envision him in the evening with a candle and just adding lines. Um, but no, he completely covered the image again and made changes because the writer here uh, is new. But if you look carefully, and I, I, I realize that now sitting in the, in the room, you can't see it, but if you look carefully with a magnifying glass to the impression, you realize that everything from the first three states is still there. But all the burr is gone, so you don't, you don't see it. But this is a beautiful impression, of a beautiful solution. From this state, which is the fourth state, he made 77 impressions. So th that's basically the largest edition. Um, two on Japanese paper. This is the one on Japanese paper in the Amsterdam collection. Um, this was a new method of working. And I mean, just making changes, but changes basically instigated by the fact that you needed to remedy the wear that was occurring. Now, this is another example in a fairly compar uh, comparable technique. I mean, this is Christ before Pilate. Um, here's Christ, there's Pilate, there's the boy with the bowl, uh, uh, pilot is going to wash his hands in. Very famous. Here I want to show you again, because in this print, uh, Rembrandt is responding to um, Lucas van Leyden, a, a very famous 16th century Dutch artist. And to the left you have the engraving by Lucas van Leyden, and to the right, but I flipped it again, so what you see is what's on the copper plate. And if you compare those, then you immediately see that he was indeed, well, inspired, or at, he was really re responding to uh, Lucas van Leyden here. Where am I? Yes. Here, the, the stairs, which is the same. Um, even the balustrade here, which is also here. But there, there are a lot of echoes of Lucas van Leyden in this uh, engraving, of in this uh, the dry point. I'll, I'll I'll go a little bit faster, but what I want you to see is the separate states and how he adds things, but also remedies the wear. So this is the first state. Incredibly rich burr, but which almost obscures the image. Then the second state, where he added some details in the doorway uh, to the left. Third state, where he added some details here. 
Um, fourth state, where the balustrade to the right is now almost finished. And then fifth state, and what he did here is basically add some lines here. But if you remember the rich burr in the first state, then you see, even, okay, but so now he's facing a problem. What is he going to do? He completely reworks it and he removes the figures in the foreground and starts adding details, but the details he adds is not developing the picture, but is basically remedy the wear. This is the sixth state. The seventh, where there is a mysterious figure. Um, we still don't fully understand who that is. Some people say it's it's Acheron from the uh, underworld, but it's it's not clear. Um, and in the eighth state, he is more or less removed. It's all these kind of details. So what you see here is again Rembrandt developing an image, but remedying the, the wear that he was encountering at the same time. The first three states are known in 21 impressions, all on Japanese paper. So they were intended for sale. Um, the fifth edition is 41 impressions. So that's basically the main edition. And then he starts, the, the sixth and seventh are extremely rare. The one is one impression, the other three. And then again, in this case, more than 30. So it's still comparatively rare. Um, but if you realize, well, that's the first state and that's the final. If you realize that's what he does, that, that's how he makes his print. For the first time ever in history, um, you, you develop the print and remedy the wear at the same time. If you realize that he does that, then you start seeing it in other prints as well. This is the woman by the stove. Um, where he does the same thing. And I'll show you. This is the third state. I'm not going to show you all the states because you, you probably understand the principle. But here, there is the third state. And then there is a new state where he adds, well, he reworked the, her, her cloak. It's, it's much lighter here. So there is rework to the remedy the wear. But he also adds a new detail. Um, the... Well, it's a damper key. This is a, a stove, and uh, well, you need to get rid of the. And you can open it with the damper key. But again, here. So he starts. He he keeps making changes. He keeps remedying the wear, but also keeps making changes to the image, which in this case is uh, removing the cap from the. From the woman. Another example. And then I'll stop about this. This is Abraham Franke, first state, um, where you can see Abraham Franke, uh, who was a friend. Um, in his study, he is looking at a drawing, and there is a blanket over the triptych, which is here. And in a later state, he removed that and developed the image. And then, this is very funny, because you can see here, he is reworked again in dry point, which was necessitated by the wear, but it um, it gave rise to the question on whether it's still the same person. In the early 20th century, scholars thought he may have changed the scholar. This is not uh, Abraham Franke anymore, but this is Otto van Katteburg, who we know that he would make his portrait, but we don't know of any portrait. And they thought, well, maybe then this is Otto van Katteburg. I am completely convinced that they're wrong that this is just like shown before. This is Rembrandt reworking again his, his copper plate to make new impressions. Um, a final example of his technical, well, endeavors. Um, this is, as you can see, 15, uh, 60, 57, so, uh, uh, yeah, 57. Um, so that's, that's quite late in his career, where he starts out St. Francis, seeing a vision of Christ, uh, but the print is executed completely in dry point. Again, all impressions of these first states are on either on Japanese paper or on vellum. That's 
This one is on vellum, it's in, in the British Museum. That one is ours in, in Amsterdam. And only in the second state did he finish in etching. But that was not very successful. It's not a very attractive, uh, I find it not too attractive anymore. And it's the only thing that he does. Of the only, the only time he tries this example. And I mean, just start out with dry point and end with etching. He didn't try that again. Um, I want to say something more about this way of working. Because by now it's clear that Rembrandt developed a completely new way of making etchings. Um, which is interesting, but in the 17th century it was not always understood. And I'm, I'm, I'm particularly referring to uh, the famous uh, biographer Arnold Haubrake, who wrote numerous biographies of all kinds of famous uh, artist in the 17th century. And he said about Rembrandt, well, he had a very long biography, but he said also, and I quote, in particular, the trick of the slight alterations or small and insignificant additions which he made to his prints, we're talking about Rembrandt, that they could be put on sale again. I, the passion was so great at the time that people would not be taken for true connoisseurs who would not have the Juno both with and without the crown, the Joseph with the white and brown face and eye on. Everyone had to have the woman by the stove that we saw, albeit one of his slightest, with and without the white cap and with and without the damper key, which he had his son, son with, which he had his son sell for him, a trade beneath his own dignity. End of quote. So Haubrake suspected that it was basically a money happy. Rembrandt, who found a trick to, well, to increase the sale of his etchings. Um, I realize that that's a way of looking at it, but I hope that you understand that it had more to do with Rembrandt's way of working, that he basically found a solution for what he was facing, uh, than that it had to do with Rembrandt being too, uh, too money happy. Okay, to resume for, for a moment, because I have a little bit, bit more on iconography. Um, what makes Rembrandt such a good printmaker? So he's very prolific, he made a lot of etchings, he is very versatile, he, he covered all kinds of subjects, um, and in his unusual approach to etching, and that's what I've been explaining, on the technical aspects of, and the introduction of dry point, introduction of Japanese papers, of, of surface tone. So he was a technical virtuoso. But is that all there is to it? And no, there's not. There is a little bit more that I'm going to, um, because Rembrandt is known as the artist of the, the master of light. And especially the master of chiaroscuro, from the, of clear obscure. What I want to point out here is that he used uh, special attention to what they call reflection. And reflection is not the reflection in the mirror, but the reflection of light from one surface onto the other. Um, in this case, it's the reflection under the eyes of, this is the portrait of uh, Adolf Tolix, uh, who was a physician. And here you can see that he adds extra light, where it cannot be from a candle or from outside, but it must be the reflection of, well, maybe the book or... The same kind of reflection you can see in these two paintings. So I'm showing you some paintings after all. The, the, woman, um, the woman reading, who is with the, the Duke of Berclou, um, and her face is lighter than it would have been if she had not been reading a book. So the, the light that is falling on her book and on her chest reflects back to her face and makes it light up. That's what in 17th century was intended with, ref reflexi, with reflection. Also, the same thing happens with this reading man, which, in, which is in Williamstown, the, the painting. It's also, from his, his face would be darker if he was not reading because the, the, the book clearly reflects back to his face. Rembrandt used the same effect. There. 
um, but also with Jan Six, where his face and all of it. Jan Six was uh, what we could would call now a redhead. From the, the color of his hair was red. That's why that's not very dark. But his face too. He's looking. He's standing with, with his back to the uh, to the outside. So the the light comes back, falls on the manuscript and illustrates, of illuminates his his face. And I think you should also notice the beautiful light that he that he got here. He is he is extremely subtle. Now, again, light and intimate depictions of scenes. This is, as you probably recognize, um, the adoration of the shepherds. Um, and I want to point out, well, basically the intimate manner in which Rembrandt basically covered the subject. Usually you find depictions of the shepherds entering the stable and they are full, they're, they're very, um, well, venerant, all folding their hands, and, oh yeah, but this is, the, this is the savior, but that's not what he does here. Um, if you look, and I think I have a detail, if it wants to show up, yes, no, it's not. Um, well, it, it, it can stay here, but because he's going to darken the image, but what I want you to do first is realize what you're seeing here. This is the Virgin Mary, who is putting aside her blanket to see who's coming in. So basically, she had already gone to bed. She had already gone to sleep, and then the, the shepherds come in. The first one is lifting his head uh, as a courteous jester, um, and she is looking, okay, but what's going on here? Which is a very intimate way of dealing with the subject. Um, and from here on, this this is this is it, it, this print is known in six states. I'm going to show you where it just gets darker and darker and darker until you only see highlights. Third state, fourth state. But what you see here too is there is already wear because it starts to light, light up again. Fifth state. And then here, something new happens because he introduced uh, something in the back and new lines here. But what you, what you now understand, this is all, well, basically not really developing the image, but remedying the wear that was, uh, was inevitable. A completely different version, but from around the same time, that will stay like this, but this is the uh, the adoration of the shepherds, but from 1954, so one or two years earlier, um, but where he takes the same intimate approach to the subject. I'm almost done. Intimate approach to the subject, because um, what you see is, and I want you to notice him. This is a beggar who is coming by, and he lifts his head. Uh, well, he is, he's endeared. He, he sees a beautiful child, and he is endeared. And Mary, if you look carefully, you see what she does, because the child is on her lap, and she opens her cloak, basically to show it to the, sh to the shepherds. Uh, clearly a proud mother, and also Joseph. But what I want to what I wanted to say, but this is not uh, a traditional way of dealing with a subject, but he almost makes it into an intimate uh, maternity visit with people being happy to see the newborn, which is, um, well, one of the other things. And I mean, Rembrandt no, knew how to tell a story, how to, 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 come, to make it intimate and appealing to everybody. Okay. Um, <coughs> the final thing that I'm going to show you is Rembrandt's ability to put a study after life into, um, into a narrative context. <coughs> 
these are two newts, um, which are, well, probably 17th century equivalent of academic studies. And we know, we know because of the standing figure, we have some more drawings where you see the same model, but from a slightly different angle. So this is basically an occasion where Rembrandt's students were drawing after a model. Rembrandt himself was present too, but he wasn't drawing, he, wasn't, he was etching, he was doing it straight into the... But if you, especially if you look at the angle of the arm, then you realize um, you're, you're just moving along the right, uh, of the, 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 well, the, the row of artists uh, making drawings. So this is a study after life. But Rembrandt put it into a narrative context by adding the detail in the, ba in, in the background here. I think I have a... There it is. And that's a woman with a toddler learning to walk. And the message here is you can only become a good artist if you practice a lot. Keep on drawing. Keep on drawing. Um, there. The final slides. And these are a number of slides devoted to female well, nudes that were definitely studies where Rembrandt with a, with a minor element changed it into a narrative. And what I want you to, sh to notice here is the caps. And I mean literally, the, the, all these women are still wearing their cap. It is drawing, where you can also see the, the stove that we saw in the other, uh, in the other etching with uh, the damper key. <coughs> but every one of them is still wearing a cap. So it makes it very much, well, almost intimate, but uh, you, you recognize that these are women that were modeling for Rembrandt. But in this case, he adds a chair next to her with a ma ma male hat on it, which makes you wonder, okay, but what, what's going on there? In this case, the woman to the left, you can see her, again, sitting on a chair, you can even see the back of the chair behind her, but there you can see that she, she seems to be outside. So she was probably put on the copper plate as a model in the studio, and then he adds leaves on the outside and uses the fact that there is not enough space to depict her feet, that she is bathing in a, in a brook. This one, again, with the cap, has been interpreted as an African woman, as a woman with dark skin. But I think that's wrong, because I believe that what you see here is a woman uh, lying in a, in, a, in a Dutch 17th century bed. Um, and that is, I think it's a box bed called it, in a, a, a bed stay, a box bed, which is obviously very dark. And it's an artistic challenge to well, depict a dark skin or a, a, a skin that appears dark in the... The final one, the woman with the arrow which in this case is interpreted as Venus withholding the arrow from, uh, up from um, Amor. And Amor would be here. You can only see his face. But <coughs> that's not how this image started. And I'll show you why. Here you can see two drawings uh, attributed to Johannes Rave, who is a late pupil by Rembrandt, where you can see that he is drawing a model with a cord that is attached to the ceiling. From in, in order to keep her hand up, she could put her hand through a, through a noose, and then just, otherwise she would just could get tired. Um, and, and that's exactly what you see in Rembrandt's case. Even the cord around the wrist is still there. But he turns, well, he lengthens it here to make well to make it into an arrow, um, 
and basically to add a narrative to a study from life. Okay, there would be more to tell you. Um, for example, about the constant development of his etching style, but I think that will be something for a next presentation. I'm grateful for your attention. Um, this, is, uh, this is really it's a lesson uh, teaching us how to look at Rembrandt. Uh, and I have a long list of questions, but I'll pick just, uh, just two of them. Uh, my first question is related to um, something that you mentioned in the, in the beginning of, of your presentation. The nature of the relationship between the paintings and the uh, etchings. Um, um, is it the case of, um, of a development in parallel, of ideas in, across the mediums? Um, is it the case that there is a, a temporal relationship, one following the other? How do you see this, this relationship be between, the, between the two? You also gave the example of contrast, how he developed contrast in this medium as well, following the developments in, in painting. And my second question is, um, also related to, a, to an example that you provided in the presentation about um, to what extent what we observe, the, the style that he developed over time was the product of a conversation with other artists and borrowing from other artists versus um, developments, internal development of the style, what you refer to as fiddling, you know, which I thought is, is, is a very nice concept. So to what extent it was fiddling, to what extent it was borrowing from others and conversing with others, and, and maybe it was a combination of the two. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and there is a striking similarity between Rembrandt's painting mm -hmm. style and his etching. And I mean, both in his painting and in his etching, he starts out rather precise um, and very specific, almost like a, a fine schilder. Very detailed, uh, and that, that's what he does in his um, in his paintings as well, and as his paintings become, well, rougher, mm -hmm. um, his etchings do too, and his drawings too. So there, there is definitely a, a, a parallel between the, the three media, the paintings, drawings, etchings. But the funny thing is that in etching, um, he did completely different things from his paintings. Well, he, he did in his paintings uh, a lot of um, um, uh, biblical subjects, but way more in his etchings. Mm -hmm. And he, in his etchings, he did subjects that he did not in his painting. For example, he made uh, a, a very famous etching of Adam and Eve, and uh, the, the the moment that Eve tries to get Adam to have a bite in the apple, <coughs> and well, the the the, the psychological. Um, the, psycholo yeah, the psychology between the two, but that's a subject that he never covered in painting. Um, also, he had made a lot of prints, and drawings, by the way, of landscapes, which is a subject that he hardly, it, it's not completely absent, but in painting he hardly covered that. So he did different subjects, but there is a clear uh, similarity in in style, in, 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 in pictural language. Now, the other uh, part of your question. Um, Rembrandt was inspired by both older artists. Uh, he, he, well, he, we saw he looked at Lucas van Leyden, that, that we know he admired a lot, and he had uh, an album of his prints that, that he paid a lot of money for. But he was also inspired by... Uh, other older artists, um, uh, Abra, uh, Albrecht Dürer. Um, there are a few more uh, where you can see that he responds to either prints or paintings, or that. He, but and with contemporary, it's more difficult because I we know that, for example, he was uh, very much friends with Roland Savre really, from he, that he, he considered one of his close friends, but you don't see an echo of Savre's work in Rembrandt, or at least 
for me, that's not obvious. So with contemporary, he, he must have known, and he may have been influenced, or at least that it's... But it's less clear than uh, with older, uh, older generation artists. Thank you. I'm going to ask one question, and then uh, the audience will have the opportunity to ask your own questions. Um, actually, it's maybe two questions I'll ask. <laughs> uh, the first one is, uh, you showed us some examples of uh, uh, students, pupils of Rembrandt, drawing after the same model. And obviously, the master, Rembrandt, was doing his own work at the same time. Do we know if Rembrandt taught anyone to do etching, or um, uh, do we know if Rembrandt kept some secret how to prepare the varnish or how to do the etching? Do we, what do we know about his students? Were there followers of his doing etchings like Rembrandt? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there is a very famous paragraph in the, the biography of Arnold Haubrake, that Rembrandt uh, kept the way in which he made his etchings to himself. Um, but the way he articulates that uh, is actually quite vague. From, did he show nothing? Or what, what, exactly what did he keep a secret for himself? And I think that Haubrake may be referring exactly how he added dry point to his etchings. There are a couple of other artists. Govert Flink made a few etchings that are very Rembrandtesque, mm. um, including the use of, of dry point. The problem with Govert Flink is that as a draftsman, he was not as great as Rembrandt. So you, you, you completely understand what, it, and it's a convincing image, but where you are often attracted or stunned by what Rembrandt did with Govert Flink, it, it's okay. The same thing applies to Ferdinand Boll, who was taught, uh, who was making etchings in the same period as he was working, uh, or, or shortly afterwards. So he must have seen it from Rembrandt. Um, but the remark that Haubrake made makes it rather difficult to ascertain whether he really taught him or where they, they were just looking at his prints and try, well, I can do something similar. I suspect that he did, that, uh, that he did teach, or at least give pointers on how to do it. Mm. Yep. But also in the case of uh, Fernand Bol, um, he was not that gifted as a draftsman mm. to make stunning etchings. Yep. Yep. Uh, the second question is something we're going to touch on upon tomorrow with the seminar with uh, students at New Bulgarian University, but I want for the broader audience to raise it here. Uh, there are uh, a bit less than 80 plates of the original etchings of Rembrandt that have survived, that have come to us. And uh, there are different collections, but until the beginning of the 20th century, there were still, some of them were still in use. Yep. And if you could tell us, I mean, it's, it's a bit kind of problematic. Uh, the plates are the original plates by Rembrandt, but subsequently somebody has worked on them to uh, increase the runs yeah. uh, yeah. of uh, uh, impressions. So what do you think? Are these originals, those impressions from the original plates, or we might consider some helio engravings, photogravures, closer to the original than the impressions from the original plates? Yeah. Well, that, that is a, 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 a very good subject and a very good question, because um, that's true. The, the copper plates, or at least 80 of them, 80-something, uh, um, are still around. And they were reprinted uh, until the early 20th century. And they were reworked. But the reworking only took place in the 19th century. Before then, there was a little rework, but it's... And again, the rework that was being done intended to make them look fresh and new. And um, So at first, you see much more of the original Rembrandt in the impressions they make, because there is some addition, but 
Um, but from the 19th century on, when they made so many impressions, and I mean, that must have been thousands. Um, they even still faced the copper plates to make these large runs possible, but it's incredible. Um, and the reworking done then basically, well, completely overturns what's left of Rembrandt in those plates. Mm -hmm. um, and it also, um, well, it, it reminds me that the first en bloc reissue of the copper plates were not, well, were not only intended as restrikes of the copper plates, but were also intended as illustrations to Rembrandt's printed oeuvre. So they, they had become depictions of themselves. Yes. Um, even with a list from the first catalogue from the mid 18th century um, to, to, to guide you, but that's what it was. So the whole question, is it really still Rembrandt? Um, I think the, the, the shortest answer is over the century ever less. Mm -hmm. Because w when you see mm. basically nothing more than Rembrandt that did, it's still Rembrandt. But in the early 20th century, when you have nothing of Rembrandt left and it's all rework that you see, well, that's, that's where he completely disappeared. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? The audience has to just give a sign with the microphone. No, дали се изучава дали се изучават специфичните уроци на Рембрандт този уникален единствен и най-голям учител за всички художници по света и до днес от който са тръгнали много стилове течения дали точно това което той е открил, се изучава или се преподава. Сигурна съм, но все пак. Well, kind of insight. Um, in a way, I suspect that a number of the artists that I know that really dug into Rembrandt, and I mean from, from the past, basically as an artist understood what he had been doing. Because they made, and I'm thinking of Closin, who was a 19th century artist, mm. very much an admirer of Rembrandt, and he made a lot of etchings imitating his style or, at, or, or using his style, but in a way that I think, well, you, you actually do understand what Rembrandt was doing. Um, yeah, so in a way, the, 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 the artist really looking at his printed oeuvre um, often understood, but I don't think it is something that is taught uh, because you need to have a teacher who understands. Um, you and an artist. <laughs> and you, you <laughs> being an artist. Petrova and you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's a great point, yes. Any other questions? In contemporary graphic art, um, there is a lot of communication between the artist and the client. And some of the uh, alterations and uh, redoing of, uh, of the prints are inspired or as a result of this dialogue between the client and, and the artist. Uh, are there any um, evidences that some of the alterations in Rembrandt mm. um, are linked to similar dialogues? Actually, there is. But there is only one example that comes to mind, and it is very, 
um, ideological. I mean, at, at one point, late in his career, around 1655, Rembrandt made four illustrations for a Spanish book. Um, and that was an, were four illustrations of, of a book by Menasse ben Israel, so a, a Jewish writer. Um, and it has to do with the stone. Um, well, it doesn't matter. But in one of the depictions, um, Rembrandt illustrated the vision of Daniel uh, with the four beasts. Um, but in the sky, um, he depicts God. And in the second state, God is removed by a sign. So that's where we suspect that he got comment on, on well, yeah, you can't do that because that's not what, what we want. Um, so there you see that probably on the f because of the input of somebody else that he changed um, well some of the details in his in his work. But for the rest, I I don't think so. Or I, no, that's not true. Not that I know of. Okay, well, um, I have a couple of questions. Um, so the first one is about, I'm actually going back to something that you mentioned, the, um, the concept of a marketing strategy, uh, to use this contemporary concept. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about the marketing strategy of Rembrandt? And specifically, what I'm interested in is um, to what extent this, because you mentioned economic considerations, did take a, uh, the, you know, they were part of the, of the equation. I mean, he did take into consideration the, the number of uh, prints and copies he's going to make. Uh, we probably know how much they cost in general at that point of time. So can you say a little bit more about this, the relationship between the artistic side and the economic side, and, and to what extent he was mindful and, and had a consistent marketing strategy? Yeah. Um, <coughs> the, the average price of prints in the 17th century was two starvers. Mm -hmm. which is two and a half euro cent. Um, lucky days. <laughs> <laughs> but that was more or less the average price. Um, Rembrandt prints, on the other hand, um, were, well, at the top of the market back then. So they were somewhere between, I think, um, eight and 15 stuffers, which is three... Four to nine uh, euro cents, mm. which would make them fairly expensive. There was there were a few examples. Uh, for example, the hundred guilder print, which is fifty euros uh, by now. But hundred guilder print, and the amazing thing is that's what I forgot to tell. The amazing thing is uh, the print was made around 1648. And already from 6049, we by now have a record of somebody paying 100 guilder for that print, which was outrageous. 100 guilder for one print, the, the average price for a print was two starfers. And then, so for 100 guilder, you could have a good painting or the 100 guilder print, uh, which was at that time not called the 100 guilder print, of course. But that was one of the most expensive, but it was sold for that price because a couple of years later, we have a letter from an Antwerp dealer writing to the bishop in Bruges in, in, in Belgium. I have this print and he's referring to the 100 guilder print um, where Christ is healing the sick. And I know that it has been sold several times for 100 guilders and more. And that's six years after the print was made. Uh, but And the funny thing is, he offers it for 30 guilders. So it's a bargain. But um, that is an example where Rembrandt's prints were really expensive. Mm. And of course, Rembrandt must have known that and realized. Um, and um, in a way, well, responded to that part of the equation, to uh, respond to, to that part of printmaking by basically facilitating his own market. By uh, there, there was a, clearly a market for rare impressions, for proof impressions, for unusual ones, 
and he started making them. Um, I have even a very strange example. His, his famous portrait from 1639, etched, where you can see him in 16th century dress and he is looking basically that into, into the viewer. It's a very confident self-portrait. Mm. And it's known in two states. And in the first state, he, he needed to, to work a little bit on the beret. But what he does is um, he had a couple of proofs um, that he, well, where he added details in black chalk. OK, that can be done. But we know by now of some 10 proofs where he made more or less the same additions in black chalk. I think that's a clear indication mm. of working the market. Yes, he was yes. responding to the market. Uh, yeah. Responding to the market. It sounds like we can teach Rembrandt not only in art schools, but in business schools as well. In a way, <laughs> yes. He, he, know how to, he knew how to get money. Um, yes, and, and the final point, because uh, we are running out of time, uh, you mentioned something fascinating. You used the word manipulate, you know, that, that Rembrandt was manipulating, you know, the image or the content. I mean, can you say a little bit more about this? It's the, you know, do you, do you feel like, you know, Rembrandt is, is a manipulator of sorts, you know? Well, he tries to, he, he goes for the maximum effect. Yes. Um, and in that sense, I think uh, he's definitely trying to manipulate, yes. but it's not in a negative sense. He's yeah. just trying to achieve uh, yeah, the, the maximum effect, uh, both in the in the way that he depicts the scene. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm I'm thinking of Mary opening her cloak to show the child, and the uh, but also in, in in the one before that. Um, but there is this famous presentation to the shepherds, so the angel coming down from heaven and telling the shepherds, well, the savior has been born and go look for him. Um, that is a scene that is traditional dealt with as, okay, the angel comes down and the, uh, well, the, the, the very piously, the, the, the shepherds kneel down and say, oh yeah, the savior is born and we'll go find him. That's not what Rembrandt does. Mm. Um, he depicts them in complete panic the heaven breaks open. There's an angel and the, the and the, the, the glory of the Lord. And that must have been outrageous mm. when they were just sleeping. So the cattle is going everywhere and the shepherds, they are, they are panicking. Mm. And that's a very recognizable way of, because what would you do if you were just lying down with your cattle near the campfire and suddenly the heaven breaks open and somebody comes to you mm. and so, um, but in a way that is also looking for the maximum effect. It's, it's very Baroque, it's, it's drama. And it's also very contemporary. Actually. And it's also very contemporary, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Perhaps final questions uh, from the audience. Anyone who might want to ask a question? Uh, the importance of Jan Six to Rembrandt. It, considerable, considerable. Um, yeah, well, uh, Jan Six definitely was a friend, and he was from, and I think he, uh, as, as, as a friend, Jan Six came from a very good family. They were incredibly rich. He ended up as a burgomaster. So also to have one of the members of the Six family in your circle was something that you needed, you wanted to be seen with. Um, the, the, the point is, at one point, the relationship, the friendship must have, well, turned cold. Uh, probably because of some stupid thing that Rembrandt did, um, where basically Jan Six left him. Um, but he had borrowed money from him. Um, and that's, that's not a problem, because that was very common at the time. But it was also something that would tie you together. Um, and he sold his loan to Rembrandt to somebody else to collect. So he, he definitely turns away. But uh, while they were, well, befriended, uh, some of the greatest things that Rembrandt did and made, um, and even they were so great. We saw the, the, the etched portrait, but of course there is also the the painted portrait, which is, which shows that it is really something, they, they liked each other. 
because it is difficult to do that, to, to achieve that kind of intimacy uh, with a total stranger. So in that sense, the friendship with Rem with this young six must have been very important. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Hinderling. Uh, this was uh, literally an illuminating experience uh, uh, to, to trace the complexity in the motivations of this process, of the creative process. At least in my case, I, I, I look at those images uh, with different eyes now and with different understanding thanks to you. Uh, and I hope that the audience also got some illumination and insight from your experience. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to have a 15-minute break 